to the forest. Not the game. The game's scary. But welcome in D and welcome in Musbrook. What? What a Lee mode is that? Uni peel. Uni peel. It's so cute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is that the? That's the club penguin dance. Yep. Yep. That's the club penguin dance. She's like sitting down and doing the. Oh, I miss that game. I was only watching a, a video uh, recently on it of a. Uh, of. Like a like iceberg you know where they go down f uh, increasingly kind of deeper lore things and it kind of just reminded me of the time i played i remember i used to have a i got like a big box of the card set and that i was able to use those cards in the card jitsu game when i was younger and i would i i, I kind of got some overpowered cards so i beat up everyone i got like um like 10 and 11 pluses in uh, all the different uh, elements Oh, I missed that game. It's it's it, it was so sad when it when it fell apart. Hmm. Mm. When when it when like, who was it again? Disney, I think. I can't remember who bought it, but they basically shut it down and then came out with a, a lame mobile game that I think people maybe played once and then never again. It was basically just a just a cash grab, and then then that died, and that was that was kind of the unfortunate end to Club Penguin. Outside of, uh, of, like, other, it was, yeah, it was Disney. Mm -hmm. Outside of, like, other things. Welcome in, sunny day enjoyer, based sunny day enjoyer. Everyone loves a sunny day. Although these days, it's kind of cold for me right now. It's, uh, it's getting nice and chilly. Nice and, uh, but, you know, that that means I get to wear some nice clothing. I get to wear nice, nice warm long sleeves and nice jackets. And welcome in to Abel Sama. There's a lot of you guys today. Whoa. Um, I have a I have a really nice like a uh, long coat, uh, in my wardrobe that I you know I get to wear for like nice evenings out. Quite quite nice. But yeah, d but then then outside of outside of like official Club Penguin stuff, there's like Cl Club Penguin Redemption Redeemed or something. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but I remember like there was load load of different like private servers. And uh, some of them were, were better than others, and some of them were not better than others. And by that I mean uh, very, very, very bad, no good, no good servers with very questionable individuals at the top. I'll trade you my sunny days, please. It's so hot now. It's spring over here in the southern hemisphere. Mmm, -hmm. you, guys, you guys are getting, getting nice and cozy. You got a better headset, so now you can enjoy your ace. Oh, that's the best. I remember I was always listening on, um, on like, basic headphones. Not headphones, just like earphones. And then I got a, and then I got like a proper pair of headphones, and it was oh, so good. It just makes it, it just makes things better. I, I find as well that the bass of my headphones are, are pretty good. So when you get like a kind of bassy voice, that's uh, quite, quite enjoyable. But uh, but yeah, sunny day enjoyer, send uh, send some of the sunny days over to to demon. I I kind of I'm someone who enjoys the the cold. And to tell you the truth, you were the first day of some more I got interest. Oh, well, thank you, Havo. I mean, my, my style so far has been kind of reading, you know. It, it's it's kind of background noise, um, a, a soft voice. Uh, I don't do too much uh, proper ASMR, although I am looking to pick up a either a Blue Yeti, or I'm thinking, guys, do I just shell out the money for, a, for an XLR 3 do is it is it worth it? I'm gonna have to talk to someone who knows about mics and see if it's worth it. Maybe JSMR. He knows a lot about microphones. Uh, JSMR is a is a wonderful ASM artist. He, he has just a naturally cozy voice. But uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm definitely someone who enjoys the the cold over the over the uh, sun, like the heat. Like I I like I like sunny weather. Don't get me wrong. But when it starts to get too warm, and I start sweating, and I start getting cranky, and I start shutting down, it's just like, ugh. It reminds me of when, <laughs> when you were a kid. Excuse me, I still have a little bit of a cough. And my dad re read me bedtime stories. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, I I will I will be another father figure for you. Not that you didn't have one already. It sounds like you had a wonderful dad. 
but uh, I will I will maintain that position for you too, Apo. <laughs> I prefer warm days. The cold makes my bone, my old bones achy. These old bones. I guess I'm just uh, I'm just a nice young springin'. Yep. Uh, from what is it? Third century. A.D. <laughs> uh, 1870. <laughs> Hundred years old, uh, young, old, still young. I mean, eighteen hundred is really just the new, the new fifteen hundred these days. So you know, it's fine. I live in the coast, so heat not that bad for me. Ah, yeah. When, when, when you're by the coast in any place, um, it's usually a lot, a lot better because you have that nice sea breeze. Yeah. Only suffer with humidity. Mm -hmm. Whippersnapper, third century ruler. <laughs> I actually saw that one of my and welcome in laughs a lot as well. They just don't make men like they used to. I know people like people like Quilta, my my good father, and uh, Fionn and Cuchul. They were uh, they were cer certainly uh, better men than I. And even going back further with uh, Phineas and uh, the various other. Heroes and people of mythology. They seem to be quite quite the men. But yeah, I am a I am a whippersnapper. I did see uh, one of my good friends, Tornkite, he got a new model. And uh, I decided to take a look at his updated he, he changed his lighthouse. He was a lighthouse owner and he changed it into a books uh, a ca a book cafe. It's a lighthouse book cafe. It's very cool. But um he got a new model and it, it's quite a young looking model. It's you know, you I guess you would refer to it as a Shota. It's about, I'd say, I like middling, I don't know, like maybe 16 or something, I don't know. Um, but it's a very cute model. It, it suits his voice well. It's quite cozy. Um, especially now that he's adding little things to it. And uh, I looked at his, his thing, and he's technically older than me. He's like 2,300 years old. I'm like, what? No. Lighthouse Bookstore sounds amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a great, a great idea. I'd love to... Um, I'd love to see like a like art of it, and then there's like all the various, various book tubers uh, chilling out. He he actually did a stream uh, recently. I'm actually gonna shout him out because he's a good friend of mine, and he did some some reading ASMR for, uh, for uh, using poetry. Shout out, please work. Shout out, work. Why aren't you working? Hang on, I'm gonna have to go check to make sure that. He doesn't have like a torn kite cha channel or something next to his name. I also prefer cold weather, especially here for when it reaches 58 to 57 Celsius. For Americans, it's over. What the f what? I I'm sorry. What? <laughs> oh, you're from Iraq. <laughs> that yeah, I, you're halfway to bo you're past halfway to boiling at that point. Are you okay, Evo? Are you okay? That sounds dangerous. Argentina, worse. See, see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh <laughs> thirty-seven. I start struggling when it gets to about like twenty-five plus. Once it starts nearing thirty, I start being like, I'm not happy now. You're thinking of doing all. Oh, you're thinking of doing reading streams because of me. That's oh, dude, that would be that would be lovely. I want to I want to spread the uh, the reading streams around. Like I I'd love more reading streams because they're very cozy. You know, they're very cozy things to do. Okay, let me look up and make sure that torn kite. That should have worked. Yeah, I don't know why it didn't. Okay, I'll just put this in here. Um. But he he did a stream earlier. I, I I caught the end of it, but I'll listen to it as I'm going to sleep for some ASMR. He did a he did a nice cozy, uh, poetry reading. My mouse pad and shoe melted. I don't think I'm okay. <laughs> like like I've heard about cooking an egg on a sidewalk, but like that that's that's concerning. That's very, very concerning, Abo. I would... I hope you... <laughs> I don't even know what you could do. I feel like if I if I found out that I was going to be facing 58 degrees Celsius, I think I'd kind of just give up. I think I would... I would, like, I, I'm surrendering to that. There's there's not much I can do about that. I'm, uh... 
I, I might have to pray that my two a day, my half non-human powers can protect me, but like, even then that's a little concerning. The summer will be colder than usual. I find I find it's it's pretty cold this winter. Um, but I'm hoping we get some snow. We rarely get snow. It's so lame. Um, and then when we do get snow, if it's particularly heavy snow, if it's and by heavy for for the island of Ireland, uh, means like maybe a foot. Uh, <laughs> the whole country shuts down because we're not in any way prepared for it. It's a very temperate climate, so it never gets too hot or too cold. Uh, so we're not prepared for either side of the weather. We don't have air conditioning, or at least the majority of us don't. And uh, things get very bad very quickly if we fe face any sort of alternative weather. But, uh, Evo, please, please be careful. <laughs> I hope you have a water source. But, uh, other than that, I've been I've been pretty good. I uh, I had singing today. We were working on some Christmas music. I I kind of want to have at least one song like fairly well timed, de like well timed, uh, to do during a, a karaoke. And I'm thinking of maybe doing one tomorrow if I have the time, or Thursday, either one. Uh, I think I think that could be fun. Now I'm I'm trying to decide: will I do the Christmas kind of themed one? Or will I kind of just do whatever I'm feeling? And if you guys are wondering, uh, you sing. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's pull it. Let's pull it back a little bit here. Let's pull it back a little bit. Uh, you know, I take voice lessons. I don't take them because I'm good. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I, I, it's it's a lot of fun to to see yourself improving a little bit, even if it's on things just like matching notes better and. Like sometimes, sometimes I can like be really on point with like my my teacher will play a note on the keyboard and I can I can hit it perfectly. Uh, Multi-talented streamer. <laughs> yes, I can read. That's one talent. I can read. I can also talk while I read. That's another talent right there. And uh, I can I can poorly sing. I got it. I got it all. I got it all. And then there's a. Uh, then there's some other streamers who are who are genuinely incredible. They can they can play music. They can compose music. They can uh, mix it, sing. They can create art. Uh, especially some of the Niji Sanji and like Hollow Live people, like the the whole <laughs> the whole package. Exactly, exactly. Reading and singing. What more? What more can you want? That doesn't necess ne necessarily suggest good singing either. It, it just you can. I I can make a noise that is is somewhat applicable to the definition of singing. I can type in Twitch chat. Is that a talent? I think it is, Sonny. I, I think you should put that onto your, your CV for your job. The next the next interview d you do, you should bring like a, a list of prior chats you've made in in people's Twitch chats. Particularly the, the strangest ones that you can find. I'm a cyclist, so the wind hit uh, five or six years ago. It snowed for 30 minutes or less than that. Oh, the last time I... Wait, what? I, I read two different comments in two different ways. Apologies. So the wind that hits me when I ride kind of insulates the heat. Ah, okay. That's good. That's good, Sonny. Last time I seen snow was like five or six years ago. It snowed for 30 minutes or less. That's it. Oh, I hate when it... I hate when it snows. I hate when it snows and it doesn't land. WWWW. Whoa, 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 whoa. I love I love the Japanese way of, of laughing. But welcome in. Thank you very much for the first time in chat. Uh, Lin... Lina Kels. Wait, hang on. Lina... Is it Linak? Els? Elsley? Oh, I'm guessing it's Lina or Lina... Kelsley. But welcome in, welcome in. Here it never snows. You'll get like, you'll get like a, sometimes, sometimes I can hail here and it just like opens up and it's like God has smited us with hail. I find that fun. I, I, I jump out in front into it for a little bit uh, to get hit and then I run back inside because it kind of hurts. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I want to do like a Christmas themed karaoke and then like I'll probably, once I run out of songs to sing, um, or at least ones that I'm comfortable doing. Uh, I'll probably just swap over to a couple of songs, but uh, I, I I'd like to do like Jingle Bell Rock 
or uh, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Although they, some of them are a little a little bit tricky. There's a lot of movements in them. But uh, I think I think Jingle Bell Rock could be fun. That was kind of the one we were working on today. It was just like, I want to do a Christmas song. And she was like, okay, let's go. She's so she's so supportive, actually, my teacher. She's so lovely. The first time I saw snow overseas, I thought it was ash from bushfires. <laughs> oh, no. Average Australian uh, reaction. The country is trying to kill you at all times. So, you know, I, I would also assume it was probably something deadly. Wait, hang on. I have to, I have to, uh, can I, can I do something real quick to, to this? Hang on, I have to, I have to make D feel, feel better. Uh, okay, there, there you go, D. Um, I hope, I hope, <laughs> I hope this is a little bit more normal for you. Uh, I know, it, I know it can be tricky, tricky being upside down at all times, but... We, I, I try to ac accommodate people. You're the right way around now. I know it's been it's been so difficult for you all this time. I, I thank you for putting up with it. But I thought I thought for this stream we could we could make it so that D is uh, a little bit more comfortable. And thank you very much, Sunny Day, for the for the hydrate redeem. The question is, before I pick up my bottle of water, do I have water in it? There's a better drop. <laughs> I will go get some water and then I will take a sip. See you guys in a moment. back how do you even drink water upside down isn't that what you're supposed to do when um when you have hiccups i think i think your body is powerful enough to drink water upside down but i i think i never understood that either i've, I've heard i've heard that thing that like that's how you drink when um when you have hiccups but i think what it means is like you kind of like lean forward and put your mouth on the on the front of the glass like the, the part of the glass that's facing away from you and then you you like tip the glass in that way, and I think maybe maybe that position does it. And thank you very much. Uh, I actually didn't catch the name. Thank you very much, Reiko underscore O zero. Ooh, uh, for the follow. Welcome in, welcome in. But uh, thank you, Sonny, for the for the hydrate redeem. What is my... Hang on, I just need to check something with suppression. I think it probably dropped that down a little bit. There we go. But, uh... I've been talking... Oh, <laughs> I've been talking a little bit loudly. I, I'll, I'll drop it down a little bit so it's a little bit more relaxing, I think. Because I do that when I do ASMR, or at least reading streams. I'll, like, I'll be reading nice and cozily, and then I'll suddenly be very loud. Because I'll be chatting with chat, and I, I worry that maybe it... Maybe it annoys people. <laughs> um, like they'll be they'll be kind of like drifting off to sleep, and then suddenly I'm just being loud. I also make sure that my ads are off, so you guys won't get that. Don't worry. Uh, blood is currently rushing to my skull, so I'm going to uh, drop down. Enjoy the the shots of my legs for a moment while while I come down. There we go. Okay. Manly legs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My my mama. Uh, I, we we talked about about the legs, and I was like, I, you know, I do want muscular legs for the for the full model. And she was like, I got you. Um, but she, she suggested a slightly slightly less muscular than I was kind of looking at. I was kind of looking at Sprinter's legs, and she was like, it can make the character look look short. It can make the model look kind of short if they're too too bulky. And then she showed me the one that she's kind of basing it off, and like, ooh, they some, they some good legs. <laughs> so uh, I will, I will hopefully have some, some good strong legs. 
and everyone can enjoy it. Because <laughs> I care about it, I, I certainly care. Um, squatting and uh, leg days and stuff are, are very important. Exactly, exactly, Sonny. Don't skip leg day. Uh, you can't, uh, as as I was told long ago, uh, you can't build a foundation, or you can't build a house without a foundation. I do leg day every day. Whoa. Okay, Sonny, calm down. It's scary. That's uh, that's that's pretty pretty based. Need strong legs to run through the forest. Exactly. Did you know? Do you guys know uh, that one of the one of the tests of the Fianna to become one in the first place, you must be capable of running through a forest without breaking a single twig, either from a from a tree branch or underneath your feet. So you must be not just strong but Incredibly light of foot and careful where you step. And of course, as a, as a one of the few surviving members of the Fianna, I uh, I did accomplish this task long, long ago. <laughs> There's a couple of uh, of various tests and uh, geasa such as. Uh, uh, Gesa meaning kind of oaths or, or s promises, uh, and usually if you break your Gesa, you you tend to die. <laughs> so I would rather not break them. But uh, to become one, he can read, sing, and not break twigs when he runs. I know I'm a not just multi-talented. I'm a very multi-talented. Oh, no. <laughs> Literally a god. Well, well, half half of one, depending on which. What you believe the two a day to be? Some of them are called god peoples, because they themselves are are gods uh, akin to those lads over in the Greek pantheon and the Romans. Some see us as well, half of me as fallen angels, or perhaps even half fallen angels. Those who did not side with Lucifer during the rise against uh, God, but also did not side with God. There seems to be uncertainty as to what we air among the uh, among the Christian scholars who arrived here and took down the oral histories of us. But for now, I don't think I will reveal. It's more fun in wondering what it is. It gives us a lot of very fun stories. Some of my favorites include members of the Fianna meeting with St. Patrick. Uh, long, long into the future. One being Oshin, uh, well known for the story of Oshin and Tiernanog. The other being, well, my father, Quilta. Although, uh, Quilta being a human, while being of the mythical age of human humanity, being capable of living much longer, as well as imbued with uh, powers of the Tuahadei, from his time helping them, uh, able to live far into the future. Uh, Unfortunately, did pass eventually. But these are things that are that are common. Us who are at least even half to a day, we survive much longer. But enough about enough about us. Enlighten us, normie mortals. <laughs> well, I suppose if we, I heard the Fianna had a beef with the Scots. Ah, uh, sometimes the Fianna, specifically referencing Fionn's band of the mythical age of, uh, but Finn, uh, to be a, a Fian, sorry, I should say, often was just a term used to describe bands of, of young men, often nobles, uh, sort of going from places to places and fighting. So I wouldn't be surprised if many of the uh, later, later uh, Fians, or not even later, and probably around my time as well, some of the other bands traveled off to Scotland to fight. And the Scots, of course, being a, uh, being descendants, well, being related to, to the Irish, I believe it was the Dalrieta. The Dalrieta of Northern Ireland. Not Northern Ireland, the state, but just the north of Ireland, the, the region that they controlled. When they uh, sailed from Ireland into Scotland and eventually uh, displaced the Picts who lived there, uh, another Gaelic group. But essentially, and uh, the Scots, at least the, of the Dalrieta, Variety come from Ireland. Whoa, Rua stream at this time, at this hour. Yes, yes, Kwai. 
Usually I stream at this time. <laughs> well, I suppose my streaming can be kind of uh, around the place at times. But I typically try and try and get it this time. I want to try and stream earlier on weekends. Like do two streams in a weekend if possible. But I'm also kind of busy with, with stuff. But I'll see if I can do it. I think it would be good to try and get multi-stream days. I could play games and then do comfy reading or ASMR. Sometimes it's too early. I couldn't watch. I, I know quite, because I know you, I think you work right when, I stream right when you, like, get ready to wake up and go to work. <laughs> well, thank you, Sonny. Thank you. But, uh, it, it is annoying because I, I do enjoy having you here, Kwai. It's, uh, it's always lovely when you stop by, so. I, I, I know that you, you often pop in and be like, I'm heading to work, I'm just saying hi. But uh, I'm glad you were able to, to catch us. I hope if you have work today that it uh, goes easily. And that uh, you can you can treat me like an audiobook in the background, perhaps. N there's one time my... Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I remember, I remember your office mates. They heard me and they better, they better follow me on Twitch now. They better follow me. I'll be work lurking. Don't worry, do you? Enjoy, enjoy. We'll get into the reading in a moment. I'm actually talking a lot longer than usual here. Uh, usually I'd be reading, but uh, I don't need to be in in a uh, place tomorrow until another time. So I kind of have like an extra hour of sleep or so. Maybe about an hour and a half, so I can kind of stream. They don't have Twitch. Ah, Kwai, you know what you must do. You must get them into VTubers. Perhaps, perhaps my updated model where I'll uh, be handsome will will convince them <laughs> but uh, tell them tell them hi if, if they see you listening to me okay it's a mission then <laughs> Kwai will like be leaving little like twitch symbols she'll bake them she'll like put like on there she'll put like a little sticky note on their wall being like reminder of something about twitch but they won't remember what it is they'll be like what the hell is this twitch thing and you'll You'll slowly convert them. You'll like uh, subconsciously make them get into Twitch, and then then you'll convince them to follow me. Base. I expect all of you to do that. By the way, I expect all of you to subconsciously convert convert people to my stream. You guys understand you're in a cult now, correct? <laughs> me to people. Do you like deep voiced men? I feel like many like deep voiced men. Although then, then again, there's people like Sasa who have even deeper voices. Although I feel like I feel like Sasa's like natural voice is kind of high, but he has a he has a very clean, deep voice. I, I assume it's probably he he's very good at speaking as well. I joined a lurk while I game. Do we get to eat pancakes in this cult? I don't I don't see why not. You know, pancakes they don't they are na neither. You know what? You know what? Just for you, Sonny, we we'll put in a little little pit bit that says uh, a little bit that just says like, you know, pancakes every 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 Tuesday, pancake Tuesday is a thing. So, yeah, we'll rock them. Now I want pancakes too. Mmm, pancakes would be nice. Do I have any? Have some, Sonny. Share with Kwai. Share with Kwai. <laughs> but uh, I've been going for for a little bit now. I think almost about a half an hour. Um, so I think I'll I'll begin the reading. <coughs> Excuse me. I will uh, begin the reading now. So I hope all of you enjoy. Whether you're listening to me for ASMR, listening to me for. Uh, the actual philosophy itself as background while you work or just to have i don't know maybe you're lonely you just need a voice in that case i don't know i, I i'll try my best to to be there <laughs> i can read that's probably how i would be as a, as a roommate to be honest you'd walk in on me and i'd just be reading a book and you'd if you'd want i could read aloud it would just be cozy I, I remember I saw someone talking about me before, and they, they put me alongside another VTuber, Olga Okami, 
as a as a good room as a good probably a good roommate out of a list of various people. They just assumed I'd be kind of quiet, which I would be, I think, until until <laughs> until I'm singing in the next room over, and you you have to put up with it. By the way, I've been thinking about going back to reading books, and lately I'm craving something to read, but like, I don't know which one. Mm, mm. Well, hmm. It depends on, I guess, what genre you're into. You you could go back to a book that you you really enjoyed before, if there's any any one that you know you remember loving. That could be a good one, just to just to kind of ease yourself back in. You kind of want to remind yourself of it, or maybe maybe pick up a book by a similar author or the same author, I should say. I want to do reading too. I it's it's a lot. I I I was reading um, since a very young age. I may finish those that I already have instead of buying. That's a good idea. If you have if you have spare books, that's definitely good. I need to I need to put up a photo of my of my new bookshelf actually, because I have a load of stuff. I'm getting quite outdoorsy, so reading under a tree seems like a dream. It is very cozy to read under a tree, or to just read in a field. It's so nice. Uh, especially when you when when you do find yourself next to a stream or anything. It's just so nice. Um, sometimes I'll sit out in the back garden and uh, I'll kind of I'll have like a little night light that will light up. Usually I, I head in when the bugs start getting annoying, but when it's cold like this, I just wrap up nice and warm. I get like a scarf over my face, and uh, there's no bugs, so I get to I get to chill out. But in uh, in speaking about this, I hope you I hope you guys manage to uh, get yourselves back into reading and find something that you're interested in. In speaking of this. I think it's time we begin our reading. And uh, this topic we're going to be uh, getting into is consciousness. So we looked at the topic of qualia last time, the qualitative aspect of our experiences. And Professor ended up essentially saying that, well, to, to get to the deeper root of the problem of qualia, we have to consider consciousness itself and see how both the uh, Cartesian dualist and the materialist approach the concept of consciousness. How does either explain it? So, Chapter 5, Consciousness. Consciousness has in recent years become THE hot topic among philosophers in, of mind, and among not a few neuroscientists and cognitive scientists too. The reason has largely to do with the qualia problem surveyed in the last chapter. The received wisdom is that if we distinguish between, on the one hand, the conscious mind's capacity to represent the world beyond itself, that is, its intentionality, uh, the idea of sort of our, our brain is able to think about things, so you guys can think about my voice or my model, for instance. But what is it, uh, in this sense, for a material thing, to have intentionality, for something to be about something, from the that's sort of a, a question that the the dualist would ask of the realist is or of the materialist I should say sorry. And to reason on the basis of such representations and of the other, the qualia associated with these mental states and processes. Then a, it is the latter, the qualia rather than rationality or intentionality that are essential to conscious state. Oh, hang on, I might I might begin that sentence again because I did kind of cut in the middle of it. The received wisdom is that if we distinguish between, on the one hand, the conscious mind's capacity to represent the world beyond itself, that is, its intentionality, and to reason on the basis of such representations, and on the other, the qualia associated with these mental states and processes, then, A, it is the latter, the qualia, rather than rationality or intentionality, that are essential to conscious states qua conscious, or, or and, b, it is these qualia that makes consciousness difficult to account for in materialist terms, with rationality and intentionality being readily amenable to a reductionist explanation. My own suspicion is that this received wisdom has things backwards, on both accounts. It is not qualia, but the outward, but the other mental phenomena, rationality and especially intentionality, 
which are essential to consciousness and which pose the most important challenge to materialism. Ironically, consideration of the views of some contemporary theorists representative of the received wisdom will help us see this. Their strategy is to give a materialistic explanation of consciousness by first reducing qualitative states, those characterized by qualia, to intentional states, those characterized by intentionality, and then completing their explanation by carrying out what they suppose to be the easier task of reducing intentional states to material states of the brain. In this chapter, we will examine, among other theories of consciousness, some attempts to develop the first part of this strategy, often called the intentionalist approach, and see that, while none proposed so far is free of difficulties, each of them plausibly contain elements of truth and can, com can be combined into a general intentionalist account of consciousness. Chapters 6 and 7 will then consider whether intentional mental states and, and processes really can be accounted for in purely materialistic terms. So we get on to the topic of eliminativism. The intentionalist approach to consciousness holds that conscious states are nothing more than intentional states, states exhibiting intentionality, or otherwise known as the capacity to represent something beyond themselves. The difficulty with this approach is that qualia seem devoid of intentionality. The throb of a toothache, for example, doesn't seem to represent anything, it just hurts. So qualia seems to be an extra element, an aspect of conscious experiences over and above their intentional content. The overall experience of a toothache may include the thought that one is in pain, a thought which, representing as it does one cur one's current situation, exhibits intentionality. But the pain itself is a further, non-intentional component. Conscious experiences, therefore, cannot be completely reduced to intentional states. In particular, qualia are irreducible to intentional properties, and must somehow be accounted for separately, independent of independently of any materialist analysis of intentionality. Daniel Dennett's response to this difficulty, uh, and for those of you, I, his name has come up a couple of times in this book. And I think it's a, if, if you may have heard his name before, possibly, uh, he was one of the so-called four horsemen of, of atheism, uh, alongside men like uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris. If you guys were, were on YouTube during 2010 and 2011, you may have seen, well, around that period anyway, give or take, you know, plus or minus three years, uh, you might have uh, regularly seen uh, various videos from, from them, and they were quite popular. I vaguely remember them myself. Daniel Dennett's response to this difficulty is, whatever else one might say about it, bold. He simply denies that there really are any qualia to account for in the first place. He is what ph philosophers call an eliminativist position. Or his is what philosophers call an eliminativist position. One that deals with a philo philosophically problematic phenomenon by suggesting that its problematic nature gives us reason to doubt its existence. To eliminate it entirely from one picture of the world, rather than attempting to explain it, he does not deny that we really do have conscious experiences. Feeling pain, tasting coffee, smelling flowers, hearing music, and all the rest. But denies only that any of these experiences feature properties of the sort qualia are taken to be. There are, that is to say, no properties that are essentially intrinsic, that is, unanalyzable in terms of their relations, or subjective, that is, directly accessible only from the first-person point of view. The throb of a toothache, appearances notwithstanding, is neither of these things. It was suggested in the previous chapter that qualia might not be essentially intrinsic in the sense that they are often claimed to be. To this extent, Dennett, Dennett may be right. But it, also suggests, it was also suggested that they do seem to be essentially subjective. So what of, what of Dennett's claim 
that there are essentially no subjective properties. Isn't it just obviously false, given what we know from introspection? Recall from chapter 3 that materialists often take our common sense concept of the mind to constitute a kind of theory that can be described as folk folk psychology. If one grants this assumption, then the entities supposedly postulated by folk psychology, such as qualia, count as theoretical entities. They might turn out to exist as the best explanation of the phenomena they are postulated to explain. But then again, they might turn out not to exist, for they might be better for there might be a better explanation that does not postulate them. I might just uh, quickly check the back to get a uh, ah yes, so folk psychology, a term philosophers and psychologists use to refer to our ordinary ways of describing and explaining human behavior in terms of beliefs, desires, thoughts, experiences, and the like. The idea is that this every way of speaking, everyday way of speaking constitutes a kind of rudimentary quasi-scientific theory. So that was just kind of a, a back-of-the-book explanation. But even if we do grant this, is there really any reason to doubt qualia, even if theoretical, are real? Dennett thinks there is, and defending his eliminativism, he revisits the sort of qualia inversion scenarios considered in the last chapter. Suppose you wake up after neurosurgery and are baffled to find that grass looks red and the sky looks red yellow. It might seem obvious that your qual color qualia has been inverted, presumably due to some playful rewiring of your neurons. But, as Dennett argues, that is not the only possibility. The neurosurgeons might have produced your bafflement by tampering with whatever neural connections underlie your perceptions of color thereby inverting your qualia. Hmm. Let me let me read that again, because it sounds like it's just the same thing. It might seem obvious that your color qualia had been inverted, presumably due to some playful rewiring of your neurons. But as Dennett argues, that is not the only possibility. Oh, I see. The neuron, the neurosurgeons might have produced your bafflement by tampering with whatever neural connections underlie your perceptions of color, thereby inverting your qualia, but they might instead have done it by tampering with the connections underlying memory. Maybe your qualia are the same as now, as they have always been, and you are only misremembering how they seemed before. The only way you could possibly determine which of these possibilities is actual is by asking the neurosurgeons, or perhaps doing some sort of neurological self-inspection. But then you must never ne necessarily rely on objective, third-person evidence to know whether your qualia have been inverted. And in that case, Dennett says, qualia can't be subjective. But if qualia are held to be essentially subjective, subjectivity being part of their very essence, then this just entails that there really are no qualia. Whatever the inverted spectrum scenario and color vision in general involve, they do not involve the having of qualia, and we ought, therefore, to prefer a theory of mind that does not make reference to qualia. And that is Denon's argument. One could object that this argument appears to be a non sequitur, that whether your memory of your qualia has been tampered with is something you need to appeal to third-person neurological evidence to determine does not seem to show that your qualia themselves, past or present, can be known only by appealing to that evidence. You might, for all, Dennett has said, still by direct, excuse me, still be directly aware of your qualia from the first-person subjective point of view, even if you don't know whether they are the same or as or different from the sort of qualia you, qualia you had yesterday just as you might really be aware of the book in front of you, or the voice you're hearing in your ears. Even if you don't know whether it was the same as or different from the book you saw yesterday. Questions about memory do not necessarily have a bearing on the nature of your awareness of objects present here and now, even if they have an obvious bearing on what you can justifiably claim to know about objects, whether those object, whatever those objects to be.
So essentially, what uh, what he's saying there is uh, the argument that Dennett has made isn't one that necessarily follows. He uses the term non sequitur, and that that basically just means that it uh, it doesn't really the conclusion doesn't follow from the argument. It sort of uh, veers away from the main point, and basically he's saying that. Just because you might misremember your your uh, qualia, your memories of qualia, because of some tampering from outside perspective and require that outside perspective to know if that's happened, doesn't mean that you aren't still experiencing a third person or a, sorry, a first person subjective experience. So it doesn't rule out any sort of existence of qualia in the first place, which is the argument that Dennett claims that it does. Of course, the analogy isn't exact. There is no doubt that you really are aware of your qualia now, even if you don't know whether or not they are like the ones you had yesterday. In the case of the book, you might not actually really be aware of it right now, for you might be merely hallucinating it. And if the indirect realist theory discussed in chapter 1 is correct, that being uh, that we never truly experience the outside world from our mind, we only ever experience it in a uh, indirect way through the representations that our brain provides to us or our mind provides to us. Then even if you are aware of it, you are not aware of it directly in the way you are aware of your qualia. But all this seems only to strengthen the suggested reply to Dennett. For if indirect realism is correct, it is only through the first person subjective realm of qualia that we know that there is an objective third person realm including neurosurgeons and the brains they might tamper with in the first place. Indeed, puzzles concerning memory of the sort Dennett makes use of, when one pushes, pushes through their implications consistently, serve to underlie, rather than undermine, the reality of the first person subjective realm of qualia. That the entire past is a figment of my imagination, and the universe really only five minutes old, is yet another sceptical scenario of the sort considered in, considered in Chapter 1, one raised this time by consideration of the possibility of faulty memory. Nor will appeal to third-person neurological evidence by itself serve to refute such sceptical worries, for such an appeal would itself assume the reliability of one's memory. That is, it would assume that one was correctly remembering what the neurolo neurologists neurologists had told one or what one had read in textbooks about the links between certain neural structures and memories. So even to trust the evidence from the neurosurgery requires first being able to show you can trust the subjective evidence of your senses via arguments of the sort also considered in chapter 1 that can themselves be defended entirely from the first person point of view. It seems we ought, for these reasons, also to reject the assumption that qualia are theoretical entities in the first place. Far from being the postulates of a theory, they are rather among the data to which all empirical theorizing and postulating must appeal. Dennett would object that appeal to such first-person subjective data is incompatible with the objective objectivity demanded by scientific method. He holds accordingly that only evidence available from third-person objective point of view ought to form the basis of a scientifically respectable theory of mind. Given such a constraint, materialism, and indeed eliminativism, seems to follow automatically, even trivially. But to insist on this constraint seems, by the same token, simply to beg all the important questions. It is also to take a position that is prima facie implausible especially if one accepts the indirect realist view considered in Chapter 1. In any case, in any case Denon's assertion that scientific objectivity requires appealing exclusively to third-person evidence appears mistaken. It certainly would have come to a surprise like a, to a thinker like Carnap, who regard, whose regard for science as the touchstone of objective knowledge was legendary. Indeed, legendarily excessive. I uh, unfortunately don't know who Carnap is uh, to be able to comment on that. Yet, who regarded respect for the first person, or, as he called it, the auto-psychological point of view, 
as fully consistent with such objectivity. What, sci what scientific objectivity requires is not denial of the first person's subjective point of view, but rather a means of communicating intersubjectivity that one can grasp only from that point of view. Given the relational structure first-person phenomena like qualia appear to exhibit, a structure that, as we saw in the last chapter, Carnap devoted great effort to elucidating, such a means seems available. We can communicate what we know about qualia in terms of their structural relations to one another. Dennett's position rests on a failure to see that qualia, being essentially subjective, is fully compatible with their being relational, or non-intrinsic and thus communicable. This communicability ensures that claims about qualia are epistemologically objective. That is, they can in principle be, get, be grasped and evaluated by all competent observers, even though they are claims about phenomena that are arguably not metaphysically objective. That is, they are about entities that exist only as grasped by a subject of experience. It is only the former sort of objectivity that science requires. It does not require the latter, and cannot plausibly require it if the first-person realm of qualia is what we know better than anything else. I'm going to be honest, I, uh, I myself was kind of struggling to follow the very end. I probably need to reread that a few times to fully follow it and uh, see exactly what they're saying. Let me let me do a quick skim of it to see if I can uh, put it together in my head proper. Mm -hmm. I'll also take a sip of water. Okay, I might, I'm going to highlight that, and I might come back to it myself later and try and understand it, and maybe, maybe talk about it next stream, or next uh, reading session, if I can, uh, I, un I understood the majority of it, it was just the very last, uh, last paragraph that I'm a little bit, I don't think I'm fully grasping. But now we get into representationalism and higher order ordered theories. If qualia cannot be dismissed as unreal, then how can an intentionalist theory of consciousness deal with them? The most straightforward answer is representationalism, the view that qualia are nothing more than representational properties of conscious experience. The redness of your experience of seeing an apple, for instance, is just a representation of the objective redness of the apple itself of the physical property of the surface of the skin of the apple, by virtue of which it absorbs some wavelengths of light and reflects others. There is on this view nothing more to the redness that, than that. Its intentionality or representational content is all the content it has, and there is no distinctly qualitative element over and above that. So the problem of qualia reduces to the problem of intentionality it does not pose a separate challenge to materialism. What about bodily sensations that do not seem to have such representational content? To return to the example of a toothache, its nagging quality does not seem to represent anything. It appears to me nothing more than what philosophers sometimes call a raw feel, a pure sensation without any intentionality or meaning, even though once Again, one's thoughts about the pain would of course have intentionality or meaning, but the representationalist would hold that such cases are not genuine cantor examples. The qualia associated with toothache can plausibly be taken to represent something, namely the damage to the tooth that causes the toothache. By the same token, pains in general can be taken to represent damage to the parts of the body in which they are felt, and other bodily sensations can be taken to represent other states of the body seems like a fairly uh, 
reasonable suggestion. Even if we accept all of this, there is still the problem of accounting for why representational states like seeing an apple or feeling pain are associated with consciousness, while other representational states, for example, your belief that 2 plus 2 equals 4, which you have even when you're not conscious of it, are unconscious. If to be a conscious experience is just to be a state having a certain representational content, wouldn't all states with representational content be conscious? But they aren't all conscious, so some extra element, in addition to their representational content, must be what makes certain states with representational content conscious, and representationalism thus cannot be the full story about consciousness. Here is what some philosophers would appeal to, or here is where some philosophers would appeal to a higher order theory of consciousness. The idea here is that what makes any particular mental state a conscious state is that it is the object, the object of a higher order mental state that represents it. So any particular mental state, that what makes any particular mental state a conscious state is that it is the object of a higher order mental state that represents it. Some versions of this theory would take, a high, would take such higher order states to be thoughts, while others would take them to be more akin to perceptions. In the first version, just as one might have a thought about some object in the external world, m one might also have a thought about a thought, or about some other kind of mental state. In the second, just as one might have a perception of an object in the external world, one might also have an inner perception of the perception itself. The overall picture of consciousness that emerges from these theories is this. What gives a particular conscious experience the particular qualitative character it has, that is, what makes it, it the case that it is associated with particular qualia, is the unique representational qualia or representational content embodied in those qualia. Excuse me a moment. Some theorists would also add that the structural relations alluded to above and discussed in the previous chapter, by which each quali whale, that Q U L E, which is probably just the singular form of qualia, can be uniquely identified in terms of its similarities and dissimilarities to other qualia, also play a role in determining the precise character of a conscious experience. But representational content or structural relations between co qualia even if they can account for why an experience has this qualitative character rather than that, still do not explain why it has any such character at all. To explain that requires appeal to a higher order account. A state is conscious where there is another, higher order state which represents it. The presence of such a higher order state thus ensures that the particular mental state represented by it counts as a conscious experience. And the elements of that conscious experience, having the particular representational content or structural relations they do, ensures that it is a conscious experience of this sort rather than that. You can already see where uh, the criticism of this is coming. The moment you appeal to any sort of a higher order thing, typically it goes in one direction. There is much to be said from this approach or combination of approaches, but it seems insufficient as it stands. Representationalists and higher order theorists and structural relation theorists like Clark and Hardin too, for that matter, generally see their accounts as variations on functionalism. Representational states and higher order states are interpreted by them as fully analyzable in terms of the causal relations they bear to stimulation of the sensory organs other inter internal states and behavior, but then their accounts would appear to be as vul vulnerable to the anti-materialist arguments of the previous chapter, as is any other version of functionalism. For example, a zombie duplicate of you would not only have an internal state caused by light reflected from an apple striking its retinas, signals from the retina being sent to the visual centers of the brain and so on, would also have a further, higher order internal state caused by the first internal state, and all these states together would produce behaviors like salivating or saying, look, an apple. 
Yet, such a zombie would, nevertheless, lack any subjective conscious experience of the apple. So the notion of higher order mental states, understood in functionalist terms, appears to add little to the materialist count account of consciousness. If, represent if representationalist and higher order theories are to shed new light on problems of consciousness and qualia, then it seems they must somehow go beyond the standard functionalism in which they are usually embedded. To see one way in which this might be accomplished requires a digression. So we're going to get into a uh, Brazilian identity theory and neutral monism. This sounds like it's going to be fantastic and not tricky at all. Uh, my guess is we're looking at um, Bertrand Russell from Russellian. I believe we touched on this in another chapter. But I think we're going to be some, uh, going to uh, an alternative version or al an alternative to strict dualism and materialism. Thus far in this book we have focused on dualism and materialism as the main alternative general meta metaphysical approaches in the philosophy of mind. That is, we have considered the view that everything is ultimately materialism, it is ultimately material, materialism, and that the material and mental are equally ultimate, dualism. These alternatives are paid the most attention by contemporary philosophers of mind, but they are not the only alternatives to be proposed in the history of the subject. A third view, known as idealism, holds that everything is ultimately mental. For example, the version associated with George Berkeley holds that purportedly, uh, 1685 to 1753, holds that purportedly physical objects like tables and chairs really exist only in so far as a mind perceives them to exist. That sounds like uh, something. Oh, welcome in, clever. Welcome in. I hope you're. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, that sounds like the type of a uh, person who would say. A sound doesn't exist if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it. Now that we require a subjective, uh, subjective first-person point of view for anything material to exist in the first place. But though idealism has had some illustrious defenders in the history of philosophy, it is generally not regarded as a serious option by most contemporary philosophers, with some important exceptions. There are two other, more promising alternatives we will be exploring, one in this chapter and one in chapter 8. The first holds that neither mind nor matter is metaphysically ultimate. What is ultimate is rather a single kind of stuff that is neutral be between, and more fundamental than, either of them. This is, in a nutshell, the medical th metaphysical theory known as neutral monism. The most important proponent of this view is the 20th century, in the 20th century, was Bertrand Russell. His formulation of it evolved significantly through the course of his long career. What we want to focus on is the final settled version. Russell begins by drawing out the implications of the indirect realism he endorsed, and which we discussed in chapter 1. If, if in perception we are directly aware not of external physical objects themselves, but rather only representations of those objects, then we have, in Russell's view, no grounds for supposing that those objects really have the property they are presented to us by perception as having. We have no reason to assume, for example, that the redness and sweetness of the apple we perceive is really in the apples themselves as opposed to being merely an artifact of our perceptual machinery. Just as the redness you see on the wall in front of you, when you are wearing glasses with red lenses, is, for all you know, not really in the walls in itself, but only an artifact of the glasses. Welcome in, Layla. Welcome in. Uh, I hope you're I hope you're doing well. Layla's another uh, another VTuber. Ooh, hang on, let me do this. This should work. If it doesn't, I'll be I'll be quite quite sad. VTuber. There we go. It worked. I hope 
Radio as well. Thank you for joining us today. Well, tonight, we're just uh, leading through some more of Edward Fesser's Beginner's Guide to Philosophy of Mind. We're looking at uh, Bertrand Russell's Neutral Monism. We have no reason to assume... Oh, I read this. As noted before, physics seems to give us positive reason to believe that the redness and sweetness are not in the apples. For, like every other physical object, an apple is, in reality, nothing but a collection of colorless, odorless, tasteless particles. What the physical world is really like, in itself, apart from our perceptual representations of it, is not something perception can tell us. Oh, thank you so much. I think your voice may be a little too low. Oh no. Hang on. Hmm. Ah, okay. Let me... It should be fine, because I am talking directly into it. Maybe... Uh, I've had this ever since I switched over to my... to my new audio interface. The, the USB was actually easier to monitor. Uh, where is it? Hello? Hmm. It might be a little too low. Just a teensy bit. I will... I'm going to add a slight gain. This much. Perhaps this is a little better. Because I find if I, if I use the the gain knob on my on my interface it seems to go almost too much too quickly but thank you for for pointing it out Layla perhaps uh, talking softly is uh, it struggles to pick it up more oh yes I have to type in focus right to control Remind me later. Okay, I'm going to just... Okay, hopefully this is a little better now. I hope it's not too loud, because I was definitely having this issue beforehand. Hello, hello. Oh, I think... <laughs> Maybe this is better. Yeah. It's a it's a weird balancing act. Let me turn it down a teensy bit. Maybe there. I think this is good. Yes. This seems good. I might have to like on the fly constantly adjust. Because if I talk louder, then I might mess it up. <laughs> but thank you, Layla. I suppose when it when it uh, hang on, I need to turn off the the auto monitoring because it it ruins my ability to talk. But I, I suppose if if you're listening to it for ASMR and you're kind of relaxing, then it being a little bit soft is is fine typically anyway. But uh, thank you. Uh, where were we? Oh yes, what the physical world is really like in itself, apart from our perceptual representations of it is not something perception can tell us. What does tell us what the physical world is really like is science. But science, Russell argues, does not tell us nearly as much as we often assume it does. For instance, what exactly are these colorless, odorless, tasteless particles of which physics speaks? Molecules, atoms, quarks, gluons, and so forth? Physics defines these entities entirely in terms of their causal relations to one another. A molecule is whatever plays such and such a causal role at the microscopic level. An atom is, among other things, what plays the role of servicing as a component of a molecule and so on. But what exactly that, that happens to play these roles is something physics does not tell us. We know from science only that the material world is a collection of fundamental entities having a certain causal structure, a structure def described in mathematically precise detail by the physical sciences. 
But what it is that fleshes out this causal structure, the intrinsic nature of the spe specific entities that bear these causal relations to one another by filling out each place in the vast causal network described by science, is something we do not know. And this is a view about the nature of scientific knowledge known as structural realism. Realist because it holds that there really is a physical world existing external to our minds. Structuralist because it holds that all we know of that world is its structure rather than its intrinsic nature. Welcome in, Teal. Thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you. Let me just adjust where I'm sitting. Okay, there we go. Thank you for the hydrate redeem. I was actually uh, reaching for it as uh, as you redeemed it. I certainly, uh, I certainly feel like I l I needed it there. Uh, oh, where were we now? I hope you're well, Teal. Our knowledge of the external world turns out to be highly abstract including our knowledge of the brain, considered as the object of neuroscientific research, as one external physical thing among others. The brain is not in reality the grayish, squishy thing we encounter in perception. That is only a subjective, perceptual representation of the brain. The brain is rather a complex causal structure of neural events, where these neural events are defined in terms of their characteristic causes and effects, rather than in terms of the qualities represented to us in visual or tacti tactile inspections of the brain. Ah, my neck is a little stiff, hang on. Ow. Ah, I hope this pinched nerve fixes itself soon. It's definitely getting better, but it's still a little sore. You're okay, that's good to hear, Teal. I'm glad. Uh, oh yeah. The inner nature of what specifically has these cause and effect relations is something we do not know, or at least we do not know from either perception or neuroscientific study. But our perception and scientific inquiry, whether neuroscience, physics, chemistry, or whatever, the only possible sources of knowledge about the nature of the brain. Russell suggests there is one further possibility, introspection. In introspecting, or looking within oneself, the mind is directly aware of its own contents, of thoughts, experiences, and their associated qualia. As materialists have argued, there are, in at least in general, correlations between various mental events on the one hand, and brain events on the other. Perhaps in introspecting these mental events, and in particular our qualia, we are directly aware of precisely the inner natures of the entities that play the causal roles specified by neuroscience. Perhaps neural events just are the thoughts and qualia, and so forth encountered in introspection. It being immediately aware of the taste of an apple or a sensation of pain, maybe what we're directly aware of are events occurring in the brain, as it really is in itself. This is obviously a mind-brain identity theory, but it is not the materialist kind of identity theory discussed in chapter 3. Materialism in general seems to take it for granted that we know exactly what the intrinsic nature of the physical world is, and seems to assume also, especially in the case of functionalism, that we do not know, or at least that pre-philosophical and pre-scientific common sense do not know, what is the intrinsic nature of the mental realm. The functionalist claims that mental states and processes are to be defined entirely in terms of their causes and effects. Russell's view is that this has things precisely backwards. It is, in fact, the mental world that we know most directly and intimately, and the external world that we grasp only in terms of its causal structure. In identifying the mind and the brain, Russell is not, as the materialist theorist is, reducing the mind to the brain. If anything, it's the other way around. The brain turns out to be the mind, more exactly the neural events and processes defined only abstractly, abstractly in causal terms by neuroscience, 
turn out to be nothing more than mental events and processes, thoughts, experiences, and the like. Excuse me, I'm going to uh, stretch out a moment. I think I need it. I know no one, no one redeemed it, but my neck is getting a little stiff. Retro <laughs> retroactive keeping the economy in check exactly good job last loft and uh, welcome in welcome in to it can't hear shit well I did just kind of stop talking for a little bit ah. okay I blinked the sound is okay now I think the sound is okay now. <laughs> Apologies. I think just sitting in one place for a little bit made my neck stiff. I will. <sighs> you always miss something so simple when uh, when it's deprived of you. It's like when you have a cold and you you can't breathe through your nose. You realize how how much you take for granted being able to do that i'm uh, i'm taking for granted being able to turn my neck in uh the normal directions uh ever since i pinched ever since i hurt back there my neck and shoulder but we keep on we keep on gaming it is getting better at least so i assume by the end of this week it should be all good I just take a slightly different position. Excuse me, you're probably hearing me move the mic. There we go. Okay. Uh, where were we? The grey squishy thing you've seen in pictures of in textbooks, or that a neurolo neurologist looks at when doing surgery, is not what the brain really is like intrinsically. And uh, if you're wondering, Toete, this is uh, Bertrand Russell's theory of mind. He's a brain-mind... Uh, what, what do they call it again? A mind-brain identity theory. So they assume that the brain and mind is the same thing. But Russell is arguing kind of the opposite of the materialist who argues that the brain and mind are the same and the brain is kind of over and above the the mind in the sense that uh, the brain turns out to just be the mind rather he's arguing the reverse that the mind is the brain the mind has supremacy and he argues that true true uh, representations that uh, we can never truly experience what the outside world is because we are always relying on the uh, the mental representation uh, where is it oh yeah if you want to know what it is really like, you need only to focus on the quality you're experiencing right now. The whiteness and blackness of the paper and ink. Uh, and I'll also say he's not a, uh, a according to the book anyway, he isn't a, uh, a dualist where the mind and brain are two different things. But again, he isn't a materialist either. He's a neutral monist, he called it. So, you know, interesting. Uh, an alternative to the two, the two main ones. If you want to know what it is really like, you need only focus on the quality you're experiencing right now. The whiteness and blackness of the paper and ink in the book you're reading, the colors on the cover, the smell and warmth of the coffee in the cup beside you, the feel of your back against the chair. Those are the brain's true qualities. In, introspect in introspecting these qualia, you are directly aware of nothing other than the inner nature of your own brain. Or, as Russell paradoxically put it, I should say that what does I... Uh, physiologist sees when he looks at a brain is part of his own brain, not part of the brain he is examining. 
that's a a very great way of putting it. <laughs> He's saying that uh, what the what the neuroscientist sees when uh, when he looks at another's brain is only his brain's representation of that physical thing, whatever that physical thing is. It happens to be being represented to him as a brain. If this sounds strange, it is supposed to be, but it makes perfect sense when one combines indirect realism with the mind-brain identity thesis. For what Russell means is that the psychologist or the physiologist is not directly aware of the patient's brain he is examining, though of course he is aware of it indirectly. What he is directly aware of is a constellation of qualia, grey, greyishness and squishiness, etc., which are given the ident which given the identity theory are identical to features of his own brain and which are ultimately a distinct effect a distant effect of the light reflected from the patient's brain traveling to the physiologist's retinas which sets up a sequence of neural firing patterns eventually culminating in the visual experience still the theory definitely accounts as a revision of common sense more importantly, for our purposes, it counts as a rejection for materialism. For both epistemologically and metaphysically, it gives priority to the subjective first-person realm of qualia, rather than the objective third-person external physical world. Yet it also seems to count as a rejection of dualism, insofar as it identifies the brain with the mind, rather than seeing them as distinct substances. Indeed, it might seem at first glance to lead instead to a kind of idealism. For if qualia are the intrinsic qualities of the brain, the brain is, as far as we know from science, made of exactly the same kind of stuff as everything else in the physical universe. Wouldn't this entail that something that everything else in that universe also has qualia as intrinsic qualities? Wouldn't qualia be what ultimately make up tables, chairs, rocks, trees? and every other object of everyday experience? If so, this would seem to entail that, in some sense, everything physical is really mental, which is precisely what idealism claims. But Russell and some other philosophers, who have endorsed and developed his position, such as Michael Lockwood, have resisted this conclusion. Welcome back, Clever, welcome back. They have suggested that what contemporary philosophers have come to call qualia, this was not Russell's own expression, by the way, reddishness, the nagging character of pain, the pungency of an odour, may well indeed be the intrinsic properties of every physical thing, but they have also suggested that these properties are, contrary to the standard view, not in fact essentially mental properties at all. Reddishness and the... and all the rest... Uh, need not necessarily exist in the mind of an experiencing subject. They can exist unsensed by any mind, and do so exist when they can when they enter into the constitution of physical objects other than the brain. The Russellian view is thus interpreted, at least by Russell himself and Russellians like Lockwood, as a version of neutral monism. Qualia comprise a single ultimate kind of stuff out of which everything in the world is composed of, hence monism. But they are intrinsically neither mental nor non-mental, hence neutral. They count as mental only when organized into the sort of causal structure described by neuroscience, that is, a brain, and count as non-mental when organized into other sorts of causal structures, rocks, trees, tables, chairs, galaxies. Since it identifies qualia with properties of the brain, this account is also a kind of identity theory, sometimes labelled the Russellian identity theory, to distinguish it from the materialist identity theories of the sort described in Chapter 3. One of the advantages of this, of this theory, whatever one wishes to call it, is that it seems to be immune to the sorts of objections that, as we have seen, plague materialist theories. In response to the zombie argument, for instance, the Russellian can hold that the zombie can be shown not truly to be conceivable when one's exercise in conception is informed by indirect realism, and the structural realism Russell conjoins to indirect realism. Zombies seem conceivable only if, when imagining them to be physically identical to us, 
We imagine their brains being the greyish, squishy things we encounter in perception. But of course, to imagine that sort of thing is really only to imagine a perceptual representation of a brain. It no more involves imagining the brain as it really is intrinsically than does imagining a linguistic representation like the word brain. To note that a greyish, squishy thing can be imagined to exist apart from qualia no more undermines a mind-brain identity theory than the fact that you can imagine the symbol H2O existing in, the, in absence of water undermines the claim that water equals H2O. Really, to imagine the brain as it is in itself would, on the Russellian view, require imagining it as constituted by qualia, but to imagine that is, by definition, not to imagine a zombie, since a zombie is supposed to be a creature devoid of qualia. In that case, however, zombies turn out to be inconceivable after all. Ooh, at the office now. Time to listen to you again. Excellent, excellent. And hello, hello, uh, quiz friends and office mates. Uh, I hope you guys are treating her well. If her boss happens to be walking past, give her a promotion. She deserves it. I don't know. I don't know what she's done to deserve it, but she probably deserves it. <laughs> They're saying, <laughs> "Hello, hello. I'm the one who promotes." <laughs> Oh wow, Kwai is the head, the higher up, Kwai is the boss, okay, well, all of you guys be good to Kwai, then, do, uh, they better do good, yeah, do your job, listen to Kwai, <laughs> and Clever saying hello as well. <sighs> I'm the boss. <laughs> I might take a, a short break. Actually, how many pages? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, I don't think I can count that one. That's very short. Uh, where are we? I could do maybe ten more pages. Boss, spooky. I know, Layla. We're dealing with someone who's high up. She commands authority. Scary. I bet. I bet. Kwai is like a really tough boss, but fair. You know, if you if you do your job well, you'll get you'll get promoted and praised. But if you go against her, it's it's instant. You're immediately fired. No no second chances. Mm hmm. But hello, hello to uh, all of Kwai's workmates. Uh, I am Rua Uakwilta, to those of you who uh, may not have met me before. Uh, I'm one of the uh, one of the pretty animate, animated men that uh, Kwai watches in her free time. <laughs> Supposedly pretty, ac according to to uh, what people have told me. I think I'm going to uh, at least finish off the next section, not necessarily the next chapter. I'll see because uh, well, it's been a while since I've seen the maiden chat. <laughs> Are you talking about? Ooh. Oh God, what have I done? Why did it open up stuff? What's going on? Okay. Right, all's good. I thought I thought I just like destroyed the stream for a moment. Hang on, how do I get Yes, be normal. There we are. Said by a beautiful man. Aw, thank you, Tornkite. <laughs> welcome in, welcome in. Tornkite was the was the VTuber who was doing some reading that I was talking about earlier, who was doing some poetry reading and that I'm going to listen to later. And uh, who set up a, a library in his or a, a book cafe in his lighthouse. But uh, but welcome in Tornkite. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're we're a good bit into this chapter. I think I'll 
I'll continue with this section, and if I if I feel like we might actually finish off this chapter entirely, which would be a, a pretty nice, uh, nice uh, session of reading, because I feel like we've been going kind of slow on this book. Hmm. Uh, thank you for mentioning very kind. No, no worries at all, Torn Kite. I would definitely recommend you guys there. Uh, go check him out. I, I tried to short shout you out earlier, but it just didn't work. It just didn't find you. Uh, so I'm going to do it now again. Maybe maybe because you're in the chat, it will be a little bit better. There we go. GG. <laughs> yes, yes, GG. <laughs> uh, so, the troubles with... Resilientism. In that case, however, zombies turn out to be inconceivable after all. Or do they? A number of philosophers take the resilient position, long neglected in the philosophy of mind, but in recent years making something of a comeback, to be a great advance over these standard alternatives. But arguably it will not do as it stands. First, the suggestion that qualia can exist independently of any experience conscious experiencing a conscious subject is highly counterintuitive, indeed highly implausible. The very notion of qualia is, after all, induced, introduced as the notion of properties of immediate conscious experience. So it is questionable whether we can coherently abstract away from the notion of qualia the presence of a conscious subject, a mind to whom they are presented. So this is kind of like the idea of uh, substance and accidents. Uh, you have a thing, a, uh, a rock, for instance, and that is a substance of whatever that rock is. And uh, as part of a substance, it has various accidents. The accidents being the, the shape of the rock, the color of the rock, the texture of the rock. And these accidents might be constrained in whatever the, uh, the form of a rock has, the limits of which ac certain accidents can apply to such a rock. But the existence of those accidents, the length, width, height of the rock, or the color of the rock, the feel of the rock, the taste of the rock, if, uh, if you're kind of weird, maybe, uh, these are things that exist only dependently upon the actual rock itself existing. Now, some theories suggest that it is the accidents of a thing only that make up a substance, um, and others argue that substances are real things and accidents are uh, dependent upon them. But this is sort of the same criticism that's being made here of the idea of taking qualia as sort of this monist thing, this in-between state of material and not uh, and non-material, or mental and non-mental, uh, that to, to conceive of qualia as existing away from a subjective first-person point of view is seemed ridiculous on the face of it. Some philosophers sympathetic with the Rossilian approach, such as David Chalmers, acknowledge that qualia require a conscious subject for the existence, and thereby accept the idealism, or panpsychism, as they often prefer to call it, to distinguish their view from the sort of idealism associated with Berkeley, to which this commits them. They don't hold that qualia, quite like ores, pains, itches, color sensations, odors and the like, make up the physical universe outside our minds. For our qualia are no doubt more complex, given the complexity of our brains. At the level of molecules, atoms and subatomic particles, there are instead what might be called proto-qualia playing the relative, relevant causal roles, properties simpler than and only vaguely analogous to or qualia. Associated with these protoqualia, and thus with molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles, would have to be proto-subjects, simple, tiny minds, or proto-minds having extremely simple experiences, or even proto-experiences. It is only when these protoqualia get organized into highly complex structures like our nervous systems that they somehow, in combination, give rise to complex minds like our own. And panpsychism is sort of like, if you've ever heard the term, uh, something like, we are the universe experiencing itself. Uh, this is kind of this idea that uh, everything is uh, 
has some form of consciousness that the universe itself and everything around us has consciousness that's kind of the the uh kind of the idea or at least like a a basic you might have heard that term before thrown around but maybe not understood the uh the metaphysics the metaphysical and kind of philosophical view point behind it the initial uncharitable objective objection to all of this is that it is just plain crazy <laughs> 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 I, I would love if more philosophers were like that. Someone, someone like suggests something, and they, and all the other philosophers are just like, "That's fucking stupid. What are you talking about?" Imagine being like in in Plato's Academy or Aristotle's Lyceum, and you put forth like a really complicated uh, theory of something, and they're just like, "What the fuck are you talking about? Get out of here." Oh, you, it, would, it would ruin you. <laughs> the initial uncharitable objection to all of this is that it is just plain crazy. And, Ch <laughs> and Chalmers' critics have not been shy about raising it. For most philosophers, if a theory has implications as bizarre as that, as that fi basic physical particles are associated with minds, proto or otherwise, experiencing qualia, proto or otherwise, that is reason enough to object it, reject it. A more technical objective, reject objection, is that it is hard to see how protoqualia could combine in such a manner to add up to the sorts of conscious experiences we're familiar with in everyday life. An experience which seems to be a single conscious experience, rather than a compos composite of billions of tiny proto-experiences which is present to a single conscious subject rather than to a con collection of billions of tiny proto-subjects. A conscious experience, that is to say, has a unified character, which would not have it if it were an aggregate of simple elements. Objection. It's crazy. <laughs> Sasa, Sasa Biyu, who's a, who's a lawyer, a, uh, a lawyer VTuber, he does some very nice ASMR. He should use that in his... Uh, he's an actual lawyer, by the way. He should uh, he should use that in his his arguments, if uh, if the if the defense or the, the proposition, uh, whatever whichever, brings up a really good argument, he should just like bang his hand on the table, shout objection, and just go that's fucking dumb, and I I propose we ignore it, and I think I think he'd win a lot of a lot of favor doing that. immediately despaired. <laughs> we will return later to the question of the unity of consciousness, a question which by no means poses a challenge to panpsychism alone. Its potentially, its potentially panpsychist implications are, in any case, not the only problem with the Russellian theory, for it seems that the theory does not in fact avoid the zombie argument the way some of its defenders seem to think it does. Recall that what is essentially to a molecule, atom, or subatomic particle, qua molecule, atom, or subatomic par particle is, in the Russellian view, that it plays a certain causal role, the role assigned to it in theoretical physics. The Russellian believes that qualia, or protoqualia, are what play these roles. But could something else have played them instead? There seems to be no reason not to think so. An analogy might help. What is essential to the particular philosophy professor fe oh. <laughs> What is essential to the particular philosophy professor Fesser who is uh, the author of the book Edward Fesser F E S E R uh, but professor Fesser sounds sounds funny uh, What is essential to the particular philosophy professor Fesser qua being a philosophy professor is that he is capable of teaching certain classes directing students in their research. Could someone other than Fesser have performed these functions just as well? Much as he'd like to think otherwise, it is true that someone could. There is nothing about Fesser, qua Fesser, that he is that is necessary to playing the role of being a philosophy professor. Plenty of non-Fessers can and do play the role just as well. 
Similarly, there seems to be nothing about a qua quala, quaila, sorry, quaila, a, or proto quaila, qua proto quail, that is necessary to performing the functions of a basic physical particle. Something other than a proto quail, something absolutely devoid of anything even vaguely analogous to, qual to qualitative character, could play the role just as well. Yo, welcome in, Kankaro, Kankaro King. Puppet Man VTuber, lonely Puppet Man VTuber. Uh, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Kankuro went on a, a long holiday uh, from from VTubing. He was off. I think he got malaria. You were you were off somewhere. Where where were you again, Kankuro? And how did you get fucking malaria? Uh, I'm glad you're okay. I heard this anyway. I heard someone say you got malaria. I think it was Daya. I laughed. Mosquito. Ah, yes. The that tends to be how mosquitoes get you. In a jungle. <laughs> you know, I for one would just not have got bitten by the mosquito. But I, I'm glad you're okay. Uh, I'm glad you're okay. Uh, after getting malaria, that sounds like it fucking sucks. <laughs> um, but welcome back. I, I certainly did miss you. I missed, I missed my puppet man, VTuber. And I'm glad he's back. Uh, I recommend you all go uh, go check out Ken Crow. He's a he's a very nice guy. He's actually probably one of the first VTubers that I really kind of met on here once since I became a VTuber. Uh, and he's uh, always been been lovely to me. Let's uh, let's shout him out. I'm getting better at shouting out people. Wait, I do SL Ken Crow King channel. That should work. Why didn't it work? Maybe there's like a time limit. Maybe I need to... The shout out Rizzler has locked on. <laughs> Maybe I need to... Maybe it's a thing that doesn't allow me to shout out people. But but I see like Clonk shouting out people really quickly. Maybe maybe it's my own limits I have on it. I'm going to have to uh, to look that up. It should work. That's annoying. <laughs> but anyway. This would seem to entail that it really is perfectly possible for there to be a creature, a physical particle. Oh, wait. This would seem to entail that it really is perfectly possible for there to be a creature, physical particle for physical particle identical to you, which is utterly devoid of protoqualia, and thus of qualia, a creature which has something other than protoqualia playing the relevant causal roles. But then such a creature would be a zombie, in which case zombies really are conceivable even in the Rosillian view. And if that is so, then even the Rosillian view entails a kind of dualism, for it entails that qualia are one kind of thing, and the basic physical components of the universe qua physical, that is, qua having the causal powers described by physical science, which can exist either with or without qualia, are another. Indeed, though Russell and Lockwood take themselves to be identity theorists of a sort, Chalmers does not, and explicitly presents his own panpsychist brand of Rosillianism as a version of property dualism. Would a Rosillian property dualism, like other, for other forms of property dualism, be threatened with epiphenomenalism? At first glance, it might seem not. If qualia or protoqualia are what play their causal roles, physics associated with molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles, etc., then they might indeed appear just obviously to have a causal influence on the physical world, but appearances are deceiving. Given that something other than protoqualia could equally well play these same roles, there is nothing about their distinctively mental, qualitative character that is relevant to their play playing it. Fesser is a husband and a father, and his being a husband and father is completely irrelevant to his role playing a professor. Someone who is neither a husband nor a father could play their role exactly the same way. So Fesser being a husband and father is, we might say, epiphenomenal relative to his effects on the world qua philosophy uh, professor. Similarly, also that's nice to hear that uh, Fesser has, has a family, that's sweet. I always love when I hear that. Uh, people have families. Some, similarly, 
A proto-quail's qualitative character, being proto-reddish or proto-pungent, is completely irrelevant to its playing the role of a subatomic particle. Something lacking proto-reddishness or proto-pungency could have played the role in exactly the same way, so that these proto-qualitative features are epiphenomenal. So not only does the Russellian view lead to property dualism, but it seems to lead to epiphenomenalism too, with all the problems we've seen that entail. How many... I don't have many pages left, actually. I have about five pages. One, two... Oh, wait, hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six... Ooh, <laughs> seven, actually. What time is it? It's one o'clock in the morning. I f you know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna push on through and finish this uh, finish this chapter off. It's one. It is. It is quiet. It's one. But I don't have to. I I have to be up an hour later than usual, because uh, so I get to sleep in for an extra hour. So that's good. I'll be out. I'll be fine. A more consistent Russellianism. Despite these problems, Russell's theory might yet prove to be an advance over the usual alternatives. <gasps> Thank you for the hydrate redeem. I was only just thinking about it, actually. <sighs> Thank you for the stretch. Slurl. <laughs> I don't have my sippy my sippy water bottle. I lost it. Um so I have a I have one of the ones that you either have to suck or like tilt up and spray. Like um It's kind of annoying. But uh We make do. I I'm actually gonna try and pick up a metal water bottle because I think those are meant to be a little bit better. I, I tend to enjoy them. And if I have a metal water bottle, I can do like, if I'm doing ASMR sounds, I can do like cool metal water sounds. That might not make sense, but I know the type of sounds I'm talking about and it's, it's quite interesting. It's like you move the, you move the water around the metal so that like as you're tapping it, sometimes you're tapping it when water's there, so it creates a different sound. And then as you move it, the sound changes. if you're like tapping on the metal. Anyway. <laughs> Despite these problems, Russell's theory might yet prove to be an advance over the usual alternatives. The reason lies not in the theory's metaphysical component, taking qualia to be the intrinsic properties of the ma material world, with all the weirdness this seems to lead to, but rather in its epistemology, its account of the nature of perceptual knowledge. Russell's central insight was arguably to see that indirect realism has dramatic implications for the mind-body problem. But it may have been an insight neither he nor his followers have taken seriously enough, or far enough. Russell's own defense of indirect realism emphasized the causal element in perception, the way in which all our experiences of the external world are mediated by causal chains. The gap represented by these chains, for instance, the myriad of, or for, for instance, the myriad, neural firing patterns, retinal cell activity, and streams of photons that come between the surface of an apple and your experiences of it, entail in his view that you never directly get at external objects themselves, but at best, only mental representations of them. Russell assumed, however, that you do indeed, in introspection, directly get at these representations themselves. But do you? In Russell's view, those particular, those perceptual representations are, like all other mental states, identical with certain brain processes, which come at the end of a long causal chain beginning with the surface of an external object. But then the introspection of these representations must be dependent on the causal workings of the brain as perceptual of the brain as perception is. If your perception of external objects is mediated by causal chains, surely so is your introspection of those perceptions. 
as brain events subvert uh, subserving perception triggered by impulses from the sensory organs in turn trigger further brain events subserving introspection as with perception introspection would thus seem to provide you only with a representation an introspective representation of what you are made aware of through it it gives you a representation that is to say of your perceptual representation themselves. It does not acquaint you with the intrinsic nature of those representations. And if we yet imagine yet higher order mental s events directed onto introspection itself, instances of meta introspection, if you will, then these two on the Rossilian model be regarded of inv as involving yet another causal chain or further causal chains and thus yet higher level representations that is, representations of representations of representations. If this is right, then there is no reason, or say, there is reason, to believe that we have, contrary to Russell, no more knowledge of the inner world of the brain as it is in itself than we have of the external physical world as it is in itself. All such knowledge would be mediated by representations. One consequence of this seems to be that the resilient response to the zombie argument can be salvaged after all. Zombies really are inconceivable, for in conceiving of perceptual experiences and qualia as I encounter them in introspection, existing apart from the abstract causal structure of the brain, or whatever, I am not conceiving of those experiences and qualia as they are in themselves, but only of introspective representations of them. As with Russell's original proposal, we can, we can conclude that conceiving of that sort of thing existing apart from the brain is of no more consequence than is the fact that the symbol H2O can be imagined to exist in the absence of water. This would also appear to restore to the Russellian view its status as a version of neutral monism rather than property dualism. There is at least... There, there is, at least, where the question of the relationship between consciousness and the brain is concerned, only one kind of stuff, but it, is a, but it is intrinsically neither mental nor material. We count it as material when it is presented to us via perception, and as mental when presented to us via introspection. Hence, the brain seems material when one examines it during brain surgery, and mental when one looks within at thoughts, experiences, and feelings, but one is aware of exactly the same object in both cases. The difference between material processes and qualia is a difference only in how we represent things, not a difference in the things themselves as they exist independently of us. It is, that is to say, an epistemological difference, not a metaphysical one. And that brings us to the last topic of this chapter. And uh, just into just four pages. So we're almost done. Consciousness, intentionality, and subjectivity. When the Rossilian views uh, when the Rossilian view is modified in the way suggested, we have a position that is in many respects reminiscent of the representationalist and higher order theories considered earlier. The features we are introspectively aware of as qualia are just features of the perceptual representational states, and features of those states, not intrinsically, but only as represented by yet higher order representational states. Unlike other versions of those theories, this one is not a materialistic, functionalist account, since it does not try to reduce qualia to features of objective, third-person mental phenomena and it is therefore not subject to the usual objections to functionalism and materialism. Of course, this still leaves us needing to explain representation or intentionality itself. But if the problem of qualia can indeed be reduced to the problem of intentionality, that is no mean achie achievement. Oh. But if the problem of qualia can indeed be reduced to the problem of, te of intentionality, that is no mean achievement, and the other common objectives to the intentionalist account do seem answer answerable. The question of how intentionalism can deal with intentional states that are not conscious, such as one's belief that 2 plus 2 equals 4, of which one is usually not conscious, 
is best dealt with by denying the assumption that there are such states in the first place. As John Searle, or Searley, has argued, strictly speaking, there really are no processes that are both totally unconscious and literally intentional. Rather, what exists are non-intentional, unconscious processes, neural wiring patterns, say, which have come into existence as a result of past learning, for example, one's study of basic arithmetic, and which have a tendency under the right circumstances, for example, when one is balancing one's checkbook, to cause certain states which are both intentional and conscious, such as the conscious belief that 2 plus 2 equals 4, Seal's reasons for endorsing this connection principle, the connection in, que in question being an inherent, inherent connection between intentionality and consciousness, can only be fully understood after we have more closely examined the issues surrounding intentionality. But the principle shows that the objection from so-called unconscious intentional states is hardly fatal. Intentionalism is also plausible for reasons other than those already considered. As, t as Tim Crane has argued, the essential features of an intentional state include directedness on an object, and what he calls, the following seal, a spectral shape, or the objects being presented in a certain aspect or in a certain way. Thinking about the 43rd President of the United States involves your mind being directed upon a particular man and considering him as the President rather than as the former governor of Texas or the son of a previous president. But conscious states characterized by qualia seem to involve exactly these features. To have a toothache, for instance, is for your mind to be directed upon a particular part of the body, your toot, and in a certain respect, as hurting. Furthermore, in both intentional states and conscious states, subjectivity is essential. The directedness of an intentional mental state is always the indirectness of the mental of a subject upon an object of thought and a spectral shape excuse me and a spectral shape is always the way that object is presented to that subject similarly qualitative conscious states always involve things appearing or seeming a certain way to the subject to a subject where the qualia determining the character of that appearing or seeming such as the particular shape of the reddish brown, of the reddish patch of color you see when you look at a tomato, always reflect the perspective or point of view of a particular subject, who is to say, to the left of the tomato. The centrality of intentionality to consciousness and of subjectivity is to both is made more evidence, evident by a consideration of the unity of consciousness. We're almost there. Consider the experience you're having right now. You see and feel a book and your hands holding it, perhaps against the background of a table, and you hear the rustling of the pages as you return them. We know from modern neuroscience that discrete processes in the brain register each aspect of the physical world you're experiencing. The colors, shapes and sounds, the motion of the book's pages, the feel of their texture and so forth are each correlated with a different neural event. Yet the experience you are having is neither an incoherent jumble of distinct and disconnected features, pages, ink, motion, colors, nor is it a collection of distinct and disconnected experiences, of distinct and disconnected features. Rather, it is a single, unified experience of a book, the hands holding it and the table. The experience has a coherent significance or meaning, and significance or meaning for a single subject of experience. You are not only aware of the shape, texture, color, etc. as separate elements, but are aware of them as a book, and it is you who are aware of them, rather than myriad neural events somehow each being aware of one particular aspect of the book. Is this unity of conscious experience we see again how deeply in this unity of conscious experience, we see again how deeply tied consciousness is to intentionality, and how both consciousness and intentionality are tied to the presence of a subject. 
The overall view suggested by the conscious considerations adduced in this and the previous chapter is this. In perceptual experiences, the, con the conscious subject represents the world external to the mind, and in introspection of those perceptual experiences, the subject represents those experiences themselves. In the first case, the subject is only indirectly aware of the external world. In the second, he or she is only indirectly aware of the perceptual experiences. In both cases, the subject is directly aware of a representation. In the former, a first-order representation of the external. In the latter, a second-order representation of the first-order representation. In the latter, the first-order representation is, representated, is represented as being, in various ways, more or less similar to other representations. I apologize that if at a certain point the word representation has lost all and any meaning to you guys. Uh, that, that sometimes happens when you're reading books like this and it's the same words being repeated. But uh, just think first order representation, external world. Uh, second order representation being uh, mental representations of the uh, representations of the material world or external world. That is, it is represented as exhibiting certain qualia, where qualia are analyzed in terms of their similarity relations to each other. Insofar as conscious experience, whether first order perceptual ones or higher order, order introspective ones, are ultimately representational, consciousness is at bottom a manifestation of intentionality, insofar as intentionality in general and qualitative similarity judgments in particular require to respect the presence of a subject, and insofar as the indirectness of perception and introspection entails the primacy of the first-person point of view, consciousness, come intentionality, appears to be inherently and irreducibly subjective. Despite the advances in our understanding of consciousness made possible by the theories examined in this chapter, we seem left, metaphysically, in much the same position we found ourselves at the end of the previous chapter, with subjectivity laying at the core of the mental, and persisting as the main obstacle in the way of a materialist account of conscious experience. There is, as we've seen, a, a sense in which qualitative conscious states might be identical with states of the brain. Perception of a brain state and introspection of a mental state can be seen as two different ways of representing the same thing. Still, since the characteristically material and mental aspects of this thing, whatever it is, turn out to exist not in the thing itself, but only in the subject's representations of it, the sense in which the mental and physical can be identified would be a neutral monist sense, not a materialist sense. Moreover, the metaphysical status of the subject who does the represent representing of these conscious states and brain states has yet to be determined. In particular, nothing said in this chapter adds plausibility to, su to the suggestion that this representing subject is material in nature. We get on to the last uh, topic of this, and just two pages. The binding problem. These matters have not been settled conclusively in favor of the dualist. For it is true that the problem of consciousness cannot be divorced from the problem of intentionality. The question of whether materialism can account for subjectivity cannot ultimately be answered until we consider whether it can account for intentionality, providing such an account will be difficult, as evidenced by what was said earlier about the unity of consciousness. We noted that though various aspects of the scene you experience are separately encoded by distinct processes in the brain, your experience is nevertheless unified. Is it, it is an experience of the book, hands, and table altogether, and of the book, hands, and table as book, hands, and table rather than as a meaningless sequence of colors, shapes, textures, and sounds. But how exa exactly is this possible? How do discrete brain processes manage to add up to a meaningful, unified experience? This is known among neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, and philosophers of mind as the binding problem. And while it is often discussed as if it reflected merely a temporary gap in our scientific knowledge, William Hasker has, argue, has argued 
following leads found in the writings of Descartes, Leibniz, and Kant, that it is most likely impossible in principle for there to be a materialist, neuroscientific solution to it, even if each of the processes in the brain encoding different aspects of the experienced objects were somehow individually conscious, in a manner reminiscent of, of Chalmers' panpsychism. This brain process, conscious of this shape, that process conscious of that color, a further process conscious of a certain sound, this would not account for the existence of a unified experience on the part of the conscious subject of the book Hands and Table as a whole. As Hasker notes, if each student in a class knows the answer to at least one question in an examination, it doesn't follow that there is anyone who knows all the answers all at once. Their individual consciousness of the answers don't add up to a single unified collective consciousness of everything on the exam. Similarly, distinct neural processes correlated with different aspects of an object or scene by themselves do not, even if they are individually conscious, add up to consciousness of the object or scene as a whole. And things are only more mysterious when we keep in mind that processes are not individually conscious. Nor will positing the existing existence of some neural scanning mechanism along the lines of the higher order states we discussed in this chapter, which integrates the information in each distinct neural process, solve the problem. For now, all the relevant information would have to be gathered together in this mechanism, which itself would be composed of yet further distinct neural processes, encoding distinct aspects of the visual field, and the binding problem would arise again at a higher level. The implication seems to be that whatever it is that ultimately binds together the information presented, either in perceptual experience or in higher, higher order introspective awareness, cannot be composed of parts which individually correlate with different aspects of the information. This would seem to, le to lend some credence to Descartes' indivisibil indivisibility argument according to which the mind is a simple and thus immaterial substance. And it indicates that, giving a materialist account of intentionality, which must ultimately be an account of, of the subject whose mind is directed upon an object when in an intentional state, is going to be a tall order indeed. Nevertheless, as we will see in the next two chapters, many materialists have tried to demonstrate that their view can meet this challenge. And that ends uh, that chapter of the book, uh, leading us on into chapter 6. It's going to look at thought. There were some, uh, some tough parts in that book, but I also think some, some very interesting uh, ways uh, of, uh, of reconsidering possible ways of, uh, of thinking about the mind. Uh, certainly, you can see the resilient conception is a is an interesting one uh, while maybe not being correct I certainly shed some light on uh, some of the more difficult things such as the fact that even introspection thinking about our thoughts may well just be representations of those thoughts and suddenly we're led into this very difficult situation of how do we even can we even explain thinking can we even understand our own brain uh, in uh, introspection but uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for joining me today for the reading. I uh, I definitely need to get to sleep. Let me uh, take a quick sip. But uh, I do certainly need to uh, get to sleep. So I'm going to look for someone quickly to raid. Let's see who's around. Ah, uh, do 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 do. Oh wow, there's, there's quite a few people doing um, doing things. Hmm. Who will I rate? I think, I think maybe for this, uh, we'll go for someone doing some kind of ASMR or something kind of quiet. Angel cat. Is she doing ASMR? Is it more art? Loud art. Let's 
a little loud. Is any of my buddies, are they, are any of them doing? No. Hmm. We go cozy chew. Maybe, maybe. Big, big numbers. Scary numbers. Let's take a look at the ASMR tag. I have a worrying feeling that uh, the trying to look true this will not bring me up VTubers. Oh, I think I think maybe my uh, maybe Twitch knows what I want here. There's still some very concerning VTuber related A's and more. <laughs> yeah, quite it's uh there's some there's some uh images. Images. Yeah, some of them are still images of uh, scantily clad anime girls. Uh, I haven't seen any any scantily clad men. I'll, I'll keep you updated if I do, Kwai. <laughs> but you know the way that, uh, that the ASMR section also has many many treaty women, like real life women, uh in quite interesting things. Uh so too does does VTubers they try and do similar Let me okay. Who else? I could read Semi. What's Clonk doing? Cause I kind of I'm thinking of maybe rating a uh, maybe rating someone else flesh tubers scare me V tubers also scare me yeah they're they they're definitely a little spooky I mean they're 3D what the hell is up with that how what type of freaks are they also the the ones that tongue Treatios scare me. <laughs> uh, uh, wel <laughs> welcome in, Nibble. Nibble, Sir Thug Shape Shaker. What a name. Poor Tridio Chan, I know, I know. I feel I feel quite bad for him. He gets he gets bullied. But uh thank you very much for the follow. What a funny name. <laughs> Made me giggle. I think uh I think I might not uh raid into an ASMR thing, even though usually I try. I try to generally I think I wanna raid into maybe uh who actually maybe me Lily. What's she doing? I'm just I'm scared of raiding into someone who has like 200 plus viewers. <laughs> mm. That isn't like a like a friend. I just go eeny meeny miny mo catch a tiger by its toe. If it screams, let it go eeny meeny miny.
I didn't I didn't actually hover on it over anyone. I pulled it at the last second. Wow, that was very non-committed of me. Let's just go. Let's just go for uh for Cozy Chew. Let's say hello to Cozy. Oh, wait, she's like a partner, isn't she? Oh, it's 18 plus ASMR. I I mean, I don't mind 18 plus, but I think Simi. Yeah, let's go raids. Oh, no, she's ending stream. <laughs> I apologize. I always do this when I get when I get a little bit uncertain. You know what? You, you know what? Uh, I'm going to raid someone who isn't doing ASMR. So those of you who are listening for ASMR, uh, just a warning. It won't be quiet and cozy. I hope no one's asleep <laughs> and gets woken up. I do apologize if you do. But we're going to raid into uh, a friend of mine, Void Kindred, or Kindled. He's a uh, very... Basically, if you, if you imagine a himbo... That's basically him. He's a he's he's a very fun, little bit dumb, very sweet. Well, let's go. Let's go raid him. He's a very cool guy. I think I know him. Mm -hmm. He's a really lovely model, actually. He's very uh, he's very good at uh, at what he does. I think he also did voice acting before, so he has he does have a great voice. Raid message. Mm, mm, mm. I think I think we should use Haru's. Oh wait, no. I need to come up with a raid message. I really do. Not just like Rua raid. You know, Rua raid isn't that bad because the the alliteration of the R's. Rua raid. Even just something like this, if you have the ability to do this. Why are they not going? I don't know. Just do that. <laughs> just something simple. I need to. I need to spend some time because I'm always so busy and I'm doing stuff. But I need to just sit down and be like, okay, I need to come up with something funny, or like endearing. Maybe maybe just like <laughs> raid ears. I need to uh, because uh, ancient. Ancient Irish and even medieval Irish often used to raid cattle as a as means of of uh, just as war as fun a bit of crack with your friends and uh, also as a means of uh, becoming a man. So I feel like if there was something like a something referring to trying give me their cattle like rua raid hand over your cows I don't know something silly like that would be funny. Well, I'll need, like, emotes for that. Fuck it. We'll do it. We'll go Rua Raid. And, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. I was trying to do it, but for some reason it, it wasn't. <laughs> I like that demon. I'm going to save that, but, yeah. We'll just go something nice and simple, and then I will uh, hide your horses, hide your cattle. I like that. But, uh... We're going to uh, raid my good friend Void. Uh, thank you guys for joining. Uh, Grab Mila Margot and Slonga Foil. A little bit of a li just kind of confused. I think I'm tired and I really need to get to sleep now. Um, all should be well. I should be up in time for my work. But uh, thank you all for joining. Atsu. <laughs>